Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Hey everybody. Today, we will be focusing on worship with our Minister of Music and a word from our pastor, Reverend Francine Brookins. We're so happy that you all have joined us today. So please hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so that you can be notified every time we post a video. Thank you for coming to church today. Have a great week. Father God, we come to you as humble as we can, inviting you into our virtual church house today, Lord, asking that you would reach out and touch each and everyone under the sound of my voice, letting them know that you are God and God all by yourself. Oh, we just pray that you bless the preached word today, Lord. Just be with us and keep us, Lord. To lead us and guide us and show us the right way. Lord, we pray that you give us the right guidance as one day soon we'll be able to go back into the building, Lord. But let us be at peace, Lord. Let us be understanding and let us be obedient, Lord. And let us into the guidance of our leaders. And to stay home to be safe. And just let you wrap your arms around us and show us all the love and the peace that we need. Lord, we just thank you for being God all by yourself. And again, Lord, I just ask that you bless the preach word today, Lord. That it reach out and touch someone in some way. That they know that you are God by them all by yourself. And then, God, we just said thank you. Thank you for bringing us thus far. We ask that you be with those that are sick and shut in, and those who have lost loved ones, Lord. Keep us, Lord. Guide us, Lord. Keep on loving on us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, you've always wanted to know how you can give to the ministry? Pastor, tell us more about it. How many of you know that the more you give to God, the more God gives to you? And what about this? That you really cannot beat God giving, no matter how you try. You ever heard that before? You ever taken God at God's word and tried God? This is our opportunity now to see if God's word is true. If we bring the full tithe into the storehouse and put God to the test, will God take care of us even during a global pandemic when the economy is down and tragedy is commonplace and people are suffering all around? Why don't we try and see if we get a testimony from our tithing? Why don't you take a moment now and get your checkbook out and get ready to write your check so that you can mail it in to Bethel AME Church, P.O. Box 2236, Fontana, California, 92334. Again, if you're mailing a check, it's to Bethel AME Church, P.O. Box 2236, Fontana, California, 92334. You also have a host of electronic giving choices. You can use Cash App 
at Bethel AME Fontana or use Givelify at Bethel AME Fontana or use PayPal at BethelAMEFontana.org and use the donate button on our website. So again, our handle at Cash App and Givelify is Bethel AME Fontana. You can also visit our website at BethelAMEFontana.org. Now listen, God wants us to test God in this one area and see if God won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that we don't have room enough to receive. It is true. The more we give, the more God gives to us. Thank you so much for giving back to God what God has given to you.
and shouting and crying and running all around my house like a crazy person. Thank you so much. Thank you for the awesome prayer and thank you for the awesome ministry of music. And we just thank God for having given us something that we could give back to God by way of offering. Thank God. Uh, even if all we had give back to God was one grape out of 10. Hallelujah for the grape. We thank God. We thank God for uh, the ministry of seeing one another's face and of being together in this place. There is a word from the Lord today. Let us pray. God, we do need to hear from you and we need to sometimes hear it again and again and again. So this week when we are starting to wonder and we're starting to doubt and we're starting to question and we're starting to be pulled in different directions, God, we just ask that you would help us to remember this word, that it would be an anchor for us, that it would be a light for our path, God, and that we would not be confused, that we would not be deceived, and that we would not be dismayed. Help us today. Hide me behind the cross, God, that your word might go forth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to say uh, greetings to presiding Elder Williams and the First Lady. We're happy to have you with us in the house. I only know that you're here because of the chat that you put in. So if there are other people with us who I have not acknowledged, it's simply because I cannot manage all these things. I'm trying to look at my sermon manuscript while I'm talking to you. I can't see your face. Y'all can watch each other while I preach. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're glad you're in the house. As I prayed about God's message for us this week, uh, God sent me back to a sermon that I had preached not too long ago called Follow the Instructions. You may remember it. The text was from Genesis chapter 2, 15 to 17, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And those in those texts, that's where God uh, makes for Adam and Eve a garden that has everything they need in order to live well and prosper. You remember, they have good company, they have good food, they have entertainment, but they just have this one restriction. God tells them, don't eat from the fruit of one of those trees. You have all these trees, but stay away from that one tree. Don't eat of its fruit. And along comes the serpent who encourages them to ignore God's instructions and they go for it and they get us all kicked out of the garden forever. Do you remember that sermon? It was actually the first Sunday in Lent when I preached it and we were still in the sanctuary. And at the time that I preached it, because you guys know I'm a manuscript preacher, I'm going to read for you what I said in the introductory paragraph. At the time, I said, we are living in an era of fake news. It is sometimes difficult to tell fact from fiction. We cannot trust those who our system has entrusted with protecting us from hurt, harm, and danger. I said at that time, the court systems are failing, the financial systems are failing, the health systems are failing, the environmental systems are failing. And in China, their government was not honest with them about the spread of coronavirus, and they are suffering a terrible consequence. That's what I said when I preached this sermon the first Sunday of Lent. I said, we're in need of the truth. We're in need of real directions. We are in need of protections from danger seen and unseen as individuals, as families, as churches, as institutions, and as the world. I said at that time, we need some help, my Lord Jesus. Well, God said God wanted us to hear this sermon again in our present context with a focus on whose instructions we should be following. Last time we said follow the instructions. This time God wants us to really listen in for whose instructions we should be following and whose we should not. So for the next few minutes, we're just gonna review those instructions. We're gonna review who God is and who God is not. And we're gonna review how to apply these instructions so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. I won't keep you long, I promise. We're in the midst of a plague, an unknown and invisible virus that has been smart enough to travel the globe, sicken over 5 million people from all different backgrounds, and kill over 345 
thousand people who God carefully formed in their mother's womb and who God made plans for their lives, plans to prosper them and not to harm them. And now 345,000 of them are snuffed out. Brown and poor people are disproportionately impacted by the disease. As of Friday, the president of these United States has fired the lead scientist, replaced the public health officials, threatened to withhold funding from states who don't reopen, threatened to withhold funding from states who he thought were sending out vote by mail ballots, and given instructions that all churches should remain, uh, should, should open their doors right now in the midst of the plague. And in order to please the president, some state governments have decided to manipulate their statistics. In Georgia and in Florida, they are lying about the numbers of people infected and dead. And it is not that they are over-exaggerating. They're going in the opposite direction for the almighty dollar. The CDC is changing its instructions, its wise scientific instructions based on new information, but also based on the politics of who's in. Do we get the virus from surfaces or not? Is it airborne or not? Do masks help or not? Is it six feet with a mask and 13 feet without? God wants us to carefully consider this morning whose instructions we are going to follow and whose report we are going to believe. This is an era of fake news and outright lies. But the good news before us this morning is that we serve a God who does not lie. Numbers 13 and 19 tells us God is not a man that he would lie or a human being that he would change his mind. Has God ever spoken and not done it or promised and not fulfilled it? We can depend on God. When God told Adam and Eve not to eat from the one tree, God was not trying to punish them any more than the public health officials who tell folks to stay home and stay apart until they know more about what we're dealing with. God knew what would happen to God's people if they ate from that tree. So God was honest, God was trustworthy and true. And God told them in all of God's wisdom, stay away from the tree. Whose report will you believe? It is easy to shout on Sunday morning and say, yes, of course, we believe God and we'll follow God's instructions over the serpent. Oh yes, I believe God, I believe God. We even start shouting around our house, I believe God. But something happens when the serpent comes along. He's crafty and does not come announcing himself as one who seeks to steal, kill and destroy. No, 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 the serpent comes in as a wolf in sheep's clothing. The liar comes in the form of a priest who files a lawsuit demanding that freedom requires that church buildings be opened even when people's hearts remain closed. The liar comes in the form of an elected official who tells you it's safe to travel knowing that they will make another dollar if you die. For some reason, instead of following God's instructions, we do just what Adam and Eve did in our text in Genesis chapter three, one through seven, where it tells us that the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. Let me say that again. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman said, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. 
she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and they made loincloths for themselves. God told them, stay away from one tree. God told us, you don't know this virus. You don't know what it does. Stay away from each other. But that tree looked good. It was a delight to the eyes and it made good promises. Eat my fruit and I will make you wise. And Adam and Eve fell for it and our lives have never been the same. The devil is a liar. That tree looked good. But when we ate from it, we were immediately filled with pride and ego and shame and fear. Pride and ego and shame and fear. And soon thereafter, we started lying to God as though God does not know the difference between real news and fake news. Those people look like they are having so much fun together outside, not wearing masks and enjoying the sunshine and the restaurants and maybe even going into their beloved church buildings the way they used to. And we're starting. Hey, hey. If they can do it, why can't we do it? Maybe we should just try it and see what happens. Wait, stop. This is the time you need to remember whose instructions you are planning to follow. Is it God or the president of the United States who told you to drink bleach and stick a UV light up your buttocks to kill the virus? Is it God or your cousin who told you it's okay and you don't need to be scared and you should just throw caution to the wind and go to the party? Whose report will you believe? Is it the pastor who tells you to do what is best for your health and your neighbor's health or the false prophet who tells you your faith should replace common sense? Whose report will you believe? Whose instructions will you follow this week? Please be sure that God wants us to resist the devil and to not go along for the ride. God told us stay away from the tree. Why is there even a conversation about it? Sin is sin. If it will separate us from God, then it is sin. The wages of sin are death. When God says do it and we don't do it, that's sin and it leads to death. When God says don't do it and we do it, that's sin and it leads to death. It's not so much about rules and regulations, my friends, as it is about relationships. The instructions God gives us are for abundant life in community with others. It's not just personal salvation. We have to love God and love our neighbor. So I might get sick, but you might die. So therefore, our heavenly parent says, stay away from it altogether because I don't want you to be sick and I don't want you to die. I want both of you to have a life and have it more abundantly together in the garden. Does that make sense? The consequence of Adam and Eve's failure to follow God's instructions is that we all suffer. There is no more garden. The people who live there can't be trusted. The seed of doubt is inside of us and we repeatedly fail to follow God's instructions, always believing that we are smarter or wiser than the living God. I think Sister Naomi talked about it in Sunday school this morning where she said that the Terminex man said he tried to outsmart God and thought that he could store up for himself treasures on earth and that uh, 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 rust and, and moths and stuff wouldn't eat it, that he thought he'd be able to take it with him. He thought he would be greedy and let somebody else starve. And then all of a sudden he found out that if God cancels your savings account, you ain't got none. Hallelujah. The people who live there can't be trusted. When I preached this sermon before, I said, we have entered the garden and started drilling underneath the ground for gold and minerals and oil 
that were all intended to be left under the earth. And we wonder why there are so many earthquakes, sinkholes, and people who are suffering, having nothing healthy to eat, when we have ignored God, done everything that the serpent told us to do, and then showed up for church on Sunday to ask God for help. Well, that was when I preached it before. Now I can say we've ignored God and over 350,000 people, our brothers and sisters are dead and counting. We've ignored God and there is a cyclone over India and a food crisis around the world, the likes of which we have never seen. We, we've ignored God and today's crowded beaches will turn into tomorrow's crowded ICUs. And God has literally shut the doors of the building so people cannot continue to play church. We got to choose and we got to choose right now whose report will we believe and whose instructions will we follow. I'm almost finished. If we want things to work as they should, we must follow God's instructions. What are the instructions? They're so easy. Love God, love your neighbor, resist the devil, and don't ingest evil. Take care of the place where you live. Take care of one another and stay away from evil. I shared a great meme the other day on our uh, Bethel Facebook group that had Jesus talking to religious leaders. And he said, the difference between you and me is that you use scripture to determine what love means. And I use love to determine what scripture means. Let me say that again. Jesus talking to the religious leaders who had studied the text and thought they knew everything but had lost the spirit of the text. He says to them, you use scripture to determine what love means. And I use love to determine what scripture means. Somebody once told me that the word Bible was an acronym for basic instructions before leaving earth. But people manipulate the instructions in the Bible just like they manipulate science and numbers to serve their own selfish purposes. So in order to be sure that you are properly understanding the instructions that you find in the text and applying them correctly, you will have to study for yourself. You will have to know the Lord for yourself. And you will always have to ask the question, what would love do? as your main hermeneutic of interpretation on those instructions. Thus saith the Lord. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Would love wear a mask? Yes. Would love give people health care? Yes. Would love give someone shelter? Yes. Would love make sure that everything that God has made has a place to have life and live and move and have its being in safety? Yes. Would love send sick people back to work without safety measures? No. Would love send people back into a building calling itself a church, knowing that the odds are that some of them will die if they go back in? No. God sent God's only son so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Lord, will you believe? Listen, beloved, the serpent is crafty. And God just wanted us to remember this week that ours is to follow the voice of our shepherd. We know his voice and he knows ours. Ours is to listen to the true and living God and do as he commands, not what this fool commands. Ours is to try the spirit by the spirit and not to throw out common sense and, and, and operate in some kind of blind, ridiculous faith that gets people killed. That is satanic. We serve a God who knows the way through the valley and out into the marvelous light. Follow God's instructions. I don't know about you, but I trust in God. Wherever I may be, upon the land or the rolling sea, for come what may from day to day, I know my heavenly Father watches over me. He's been the one who saw me from my mother's womb. God has been the one who has brought me to this day. God is the one who made the plans for my life. I'm not listening to the serpent. I'm tired of the serpent. I'm sick of falling for his tricks. I don't know about you come and go with me and follow God's instructions that you love God and you love your neighbor as yourself.
This is an invitation to real Christian discipleship, not to come back to buildings, but to come back and remember your first love. Remember the place where you first met Jesus. That's the place inside you that will allow you to run all over your living room in a virtual service and feel the fire of your neighbor's song. I want to invite you to remember your first love. And if you've never met Jesus for yourself, I want to extend to you an invitation to meet my best friend, my older brother, my savior, my redeemer, and sometimes the one who whoops my tail. Because we learn in Sunday school that sometimes, you know, God has to whoop us because we get, you know, we get it twisted sometimes. I think that's because of Adam and Eve. I'm going to do, I'm going to do a Trump and just blame them. But right now is the moment of reckoning. It's the man in the mirror. It's the woman in the mirror. And you have an opportunity to get right with God and to allow God to make you right. We don't do this on our own. We do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so right now, if you would like to give your life to Christ, I would invite you just to raise your hand and also to put something in the chat room so that we can come to you after this and have further conversation about what's happening in this marvelous change that is about to come into your life. Let us pray. God, we are sinners, all of us. No matter what good we have done, no matter how well we have followed your law, we are trapped in the belly of the beast and we have to make choices that are difficult. We have to navigate systems that are not clear paths, God. We, we don't know everything. We are sinners. And so right now we thank you for your son. We thank you that you so love this old cold world that wouldn't listen to you, that you sent your only begotten son to save a sinner like us. And right now, our brother, our sister, God, they need you and they're, they're coming forward to you in their heart and they're wanting to be right. Thank you that you are a God who can make us right. That we have never fallen so far that you can't catch us. Thank you, Jesus. Right now, we acknowledge that you are Lord. You are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. You are Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Healer, our Deliverer. We acknowledge that you got up after they killed you and they thought they had won, but God wins this battle and we want to be on the Lord's side. So God, we give ourselves to you right now and we ask that you would take our lives and be Lord of them. Have your way with us. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. And the people of God together said, amen, amen, and amen. Are you safe? Have you given your life to Christ? Are you wrapped up in the grace of God? Have you confessed that you are a sinner, meaning that you do all kinds of things that separate you from the will of God, and that you would really like it if Jesus would help you out, would step into your life, come into your heart, and take over your to-do list? take over your identity, take over the plans for your life. I want to offer Christ to you this morning. Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. Now, I don't have any commentary about Buddha or Allah or any of those. That may be your path. But I can tell you that Jesus is the answer. He's the answer for, I think, for the world today but he's certainly the answer for my life. And I wanna offer him to you today. Pray with me. God, I come humbly now before you, confessing that I am a sinner. I have tried to save myself and tried to be Lord over my own life, but it has not worked. And so today, I come confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I want him to come into my heart and take over my life. I believe that he came and he taught us the way. That he died at Calvary. And that he rose again so that I might be able to rise again after the mistakes and tragedies of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. 
I am redeemed. I am redeemed. Congratulations on your new life in Christ. If you just prayed this prayer, please reach out to us so that we can help you as you continue your walk with God.